Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. It is wonderful to see familiar faces and new ones. I am Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. The National Constitution Center, as you know, is the only institution in the country chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. In fact, those of you who have been to our great town hall should be able to recite that mission <laughs> statement with me in unison. And I am so proud of the superb programs that we've been having over the past couple weeks and in the coming weeks that fulfill that mission. Uh, just last night, in conjunction with the University of Pennsylvania, we had an all-star panel about the future of NSA surveillance with uh, Peter Swire from the President's Intelligence Commission, Charlie Savage of the New York Times, and Anita Allen from the University of Pennsylvania. On March 5th, we are going to have our first partnership with IQ Squared, Intelligence Squared, the great debating series, where Alan Dershowitz and Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School will debate the question of whether the president has the constitutional authority to target and kill American citizens abroad, which is a, a topic we'll be also talking about today. And the following day, if that's not enough, on March 6th, uh, Zeke Emanuel, the vice provost at, at Penn, uh, and as it happens, my roommate here in Philadelphia, will come to discuss his uh, definitive book on the future of health care reform. And I hope to see all of you at those and many, many other town hall programs that we have coming up. Um, I am especially excited about today's program. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this program, which is presented in conjunction with One Book, One Philadelphia's celebration of Kevin Powers' The Yellow Birds. The Yellow Birds, as those of you who have read it know, is a haunting memoir by an Iraq veteran of his time in the military. And here at the National Constitution Center, we have decided to focus on the constitutional dimensions of executive power. And to do so, I cannot imagine a more timely book than the one that we're going to be discussing today, Emergency Presidential Power from the Drafting of the Constitution to the War on Terror by Chris Edelson, is to my mind one of the most concise and balanced and helpful introductions to this most vexing of all topics that could be imagined. It combines thoughtful commentary that really present both sides of these incredibly vexing issues with primary sources so that you can read the great excerpts from the thrilling Supreme Court opinions like Robert Jackson's celebrated concurrence in the Youngstown Steel case, which achieves a kind of constitutional poetry. And at the same time, you get Professor Edelson's uh, firm uh, defense of uh, uh, a position uh, about the importance of the president seeking congressional support for his actions, which we're going to be discussing uh, extensively today. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor Edelson, who um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at American University. Uh, before joining the AU faculty, he practiced employment discrimination law and was state legislative director for the Human Rights Campaign. And this great book it, uh, was published in the fall of 2013 and is available in the museum store. So please do be sure to pick up your copy after the program. Uh, as Professor Edelson's respondent, we have the really the world expert on uh, presidential authority and Congress's role in constraining it. I've known and learned from Lou Fisher for many years, who is uh, widely viewed as the master of this field. He is a scholar and resident at the Constitution Project. And previously, when I first met Lou, he worked for four decades at the Library of Congress as the senior specialist in separation of powers and specialist in constitutional law. He's testified before Congress more than 50 times on issues such as war power, state privilege, NSA surveillance, and so forth, and has written more than 470 scholarly articles and several books. And by wonderful coincidence, we'd invited uh, Lou and Chris separately, not realizing that Lou Fisher actually wrote the foreword to this uh, great book, so he didn't have to do any extra homework uh, in preparation. Sounds great to me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, it was just excellent luck. So uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We've got a lot to talk about. I want to jump right in, Chris. And uh, in your book, uh, starting with the time of President Washington, taking us all the way to the time of President Obama, you describe a dramatic clash between two views of executive power. And one 
you call very clearly executive unilateralism, mm -hmm. the view that the president basically is unconstrained in foreign affairs and can use his commander in chief power to do what he wants. And the other you don't name, so I guess I'll ask you to come up with a name for it. Yeah. Is it uh, executive bilateralism or constitutional constraint or something, which says that the president really needs congressional support to do most of what he does in foreign affairs. So tell us about the roots of that historic clash. Yeah, so I think cons constitutional constraint is probably a good way to define it. As Jeff said, thank you for the very kind uh, words about the book. Um, so there has been this debate that goes back to the beginning. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison debated about this during the Washington presidency. Um, there's debate during when the Constitution was being drafted. Um, it's, and this, I think it reflects the competing views of the drafters of the Constitution themselves. Uh, the Articles of Confederation had failed, partly in large part because the federal government was not strong enough. There was no executive branch under the Articles of Confederation. The drafters of the Constitution were people who learned from experience, and they saw this was a failure. They'd gone too far. They were understandably reluctant to create a new monarch in the United States. They didn't want that. But they also realized we need somebody who can be can, uh, somebody in the executive branch. So they created the presidency. And they clearly wanted to make sure the president would have enough authority to carry out responsibilities, including during wartime. That had been a problem during the Revolutionary War, not having one executive who General Washington could report to. But they also wanted to set limits on power. Alexander Hamilton the drafter who probably was most supportive of a strong executive uh, wrote in Federal 69, we are not creating a king. So there's been this debate that's gone on throughout since, since the Constitution was drafted and was present in the beginning itself. And the way I look at it is you have to satisfy both of these competing impulses. How do you give the president enough power to deal with emergencies, to, uh, to uh, provide for national security along with Congress? Um, but at the same time, how do you set limits? Well, that's a great description. And uh, Lou, um, give us a sense of the historic clashes that shaped that debate. Chris, Chris talks about the debate over Washington's decision to issue a neutrality proclamation on his own without congressional approval. And then give us the strongest case on the other side for the really robust view of executive power uh, taken by those who say that the president essentially uh, c can act without congressional approval. OK, the framers recognized that the president would need to repel sudden attacks, when, particularly if Congress is not in session. So he had a defensive capacity. All the framers understood that the decision to take the country from a state of peace to a state of war was 100% with Congress. And not only was that the framers' view, that was the pattern of presidents from 1789 up to 1950, every president who wanted to go to war knew they had to come to Congress, either for a declaration of war or an authorization. That was all, and what changed things, and we're still living with it, is Truman's decision to go to war against North Korea without coming to Congress, getting, quote, authority from the Security Council. And just to balance what Chris said on the other side, uh, I think Dwight D. Eisenhower understood that was a, not just a political mistake, but a constitutional mistake. And Eisenhower made the point, which I think is a very sound one, that the country is safer when the two elected branches act jointly. And that sends the right message to allies and to enemies. And the worst, the weakest position is when a president goes flying off by himself. Well, both of you do make the point that things seem to have changed in the 1950s, in particular President Truman, who is now widely thought of as quite successful in foreign affairs, pushed the envelope both uh, in terms of uh, declaring war on his own and also in asserting the power to seize the steel mills without congressional approval, a position the Supreme Court rejected. We'll talk about that in a bit, but before we get to the 1950s, Chris, give us the greatest hits of executive unilateralism throughout history. Do you want to tell us about President Lincoln, who did make some rather bold assertions of yes. executive power, but then sought congressional approval retrospectively? Absolutely. So one reason I wrote this book is I was interested. I was living in New York on September 11th. I was really scared. I was scared about what would happen. I wanted to make sure that things would be done to protect the United States. But as time went on, I also realized, wait, it's important. Are we going to maintain a constitutional government? And I heard arguments being made for extraordinary actions, um, like warrantless surveillance, torture, uh, complete presidential control over military force, which, as Lou points out, is not what the Constitution provides for. Precedents were cited for these actions. People would say, people who defended broad presidential action would say, well, Lincoln did this. Lincoln took unilateral action himself. He had military trials. That is true, but what they're 
overlooking or leaving out of the story is Lincoln, as Jeff mentions, recognized limits on his power. He, uh, he, he recognized the rule of law when he took unilateral actions at the beginning of the Civil War, including suspending habeas corpus between Philadelphia and Washington, um, ordering a blockade of the South. He, w he sent a message to Congress on July 4th, 1861, and he said, some of the things I did were not strictly legal, and I'm asking you, Congress, to take action now and uh, decide what you want. He left it to them, and he recognized that he did not. Some people have argued that Lincoln was act, uh, acting based on prerogative, authority to set aside the law, or there was a book written called Constitutional Dictatorship, that during a war or an emergency, the president can just do what he or she wants. Um, Lincoln did not believe that. Lincoln believed that he was acting in Congress's place during an emergency, a real emergency, the Civil War, and he, he specifically went to Congress, asked for their approval, and for the most part gained it. So Lincoln is cited by people who believe in the idea of broad presidential power, but I think they're missing an important piece, which is that Lincoln recognized that he, he could not do what he wanted. He, he could not do uh, what he wanted without Congress's approval. There were limits on presidential power. And although he could act during an emergency unilaterally, he needed to place those actions within the rule of law by getting approval from Congress. So t tell us a little more about uh, Lincoln and why he acted as he did. He said, yeah. are all the laws but one to go right. uh, unexecuted? You know, in other words, the union collapses because I'm going to obey the habeas corpus provisions. Yes. And he was sharply criticized, as you say, by Chief Justice Taney in the Merriman case. Yes. I have, I was given as a uh, present a uh, copy of the Merriman opinion that says, printed under the authority of the Chief Justice. Basically, Lincoln so ignored Taney that Taney had to print the thing up on his own, at his own dime and was going around Washington handing it out yes. to anyone who would pay attention because Lincoln was, had contempt for him. But in the end, Lincoln did go to Congress and get he retrospective did. approval. So and this what was case, his vision? This case was sort of a personal crusade for Taney. Taney, of course, came from a slaveholding family. He believed that the South had the right to secede. He did not believe in war, but he didn't. Lincoln had a very different view. They were political rivals, really enemies. And so when this man, John Merriman, was taken into custody, and the, re the reason Lincoln ordered or gave authority to the commanding general of the Union Army, uh, Winfield Scott, to suspend habeas corpus between Philadelphia and Washington, was a real tangible problem. Washington was in danger of being cut off. Virginia had seceded from the Union. Maryland, uh, there was a lot of sympathy for the South there, was a slaveholding state, and the legislature was considering seceding as well. So Lincoln was concerned that Washington would be cut off, and he needed troops to get through from the north, farther, up, farther north to Washington. And because uh, troops had to come through Baltimore in the train and get off the train and go to another one, they were met by pro uh, pro-secessionist mobs there who attacked the troops, some were killed, and Lincoln basically said, I can't have this, I need troops to be able to get through, I need to do something about this danger in Maryland, and he ordered, he gave authority for the general to suspend habeas corpus. John Merriman was taken into custody. He managed to get a lawyer to file a petition for rid of habeas corpus with Chief Justice Taney, this opponent of Lincoln's, sympathetic to the South, and uh, Taney's opinion basically says, Lincoln, the president has no emergency power, it's an, it's, a, it's an incredible opinion to read because if you read Taney's opinion, you wouldn't know the Civil War was going on at the time. He basically says, hey, if this guy was dangerous, go through the ordinary courts. They are open. You could have the normal criminal process apply. And what uh, Taney didn't recognize, but Lincoln had to, was it was not clear that Maryland was a sympathetic place. The governor, some state legislators were sympathetic to the South, and it wasn't an ordinary situation. So when the decision was handed down, Taney said, I, I think the president cannot do this alone, needs to get approval from Congress, but there are limits to what I can do. I can't force him to do this. And Lincoln did, did not follow the opinion, but I wouldn't say he ignored it because he did respond to it, as Jeff says, in his message to Congress, July 4th, 1861. And he made two arguments about that. First, he said this famous line, am I to ignore all the laws but one? And there, he's taking into account the context that Taney did not. Lincoln's saying, wait, there was a civil war going on and things in Maryland were not ordinary. Um, if all the laws were being ignored because there was a rebellion, am I supposed to enforce this one? And, but what he meant by that was uh, not suspend habeas corpus, give people access to the courts. Now, he said after that, though, I do not think this... So that's, if you read that, you think, oh, he's saying I have the ability to set aside the law, to act during an emergency, to suspend habeas corpus, even if normally I wouldn't be able to. The next thing he says after that in his message, though, is... I do not think that was the case. I do not think I acted illegally here because he makes an interesting argument. He says, maybe the power to suspend habeas corpus is shared between the president and Congress. I'm not sure I agree with that, but what's important about that is he's making a constitutional argument. He's saying, 
there's an idea, Arthur Schlesinger has written about this, and he says Lincoln constitutionalized Lockean prerogative. The idea that during an emergency, the, the executive can simply set aside the law. I don't think that's what Lincoln was doing. Lincoln didn't say I can do this simply because I'm president. He made an argument about the Constitution. And at the very end of his message, he says, I'm now, you, Congress, can do what you want about this. And Congress ultimately passed the Habeas Corpus Act of 1863 and said, you're right. There is a rebellion going on. Sometimes you'll need authority to hold people for a limited period of time. Uh, Lou, did Lincoln, Lincoln evolve? As, as a congressman, he had passed the famous spot resolutions. President Polk comes up with this trumped up idea for the Mexican War, claiming the troops had crossed into American territory. And Lincoln legalistically says, show me the spot where they crossed the border. But as president, even if he didn't quite constitutionalize this Lockean prerogative and say the president can do whatever he wants in an emergency, was he much more pragmatic about the need to take temporary election, uh, action that may have been illegal I think, I think Lincoln, of course, there, he was a Whig at that time. I think Lincoln and the Whigs were correct that Pope said very inflammatory language, uh, American blood has been shed on American soil. The previous year, Polk had told the nation, I don't know where the boundary is between Texas and Mexico at this point. So he didn't know where the boundary was. He later tried to find out where the boundary was. So uh, that was the case where a president lied to the country. Uh, to go to war, uh, and I think Lincoln was correct. As Chris says in the Civil War, in the July 4th, 1861 speech, Lincoln, I think, expressed probably the deepest understanding of the Constitution we have ever had from a president, and that is he told Congress, uh, as, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, whether it's strictly legal or not, that was sort of a nice phrase, but then he says, I don't think I, as president, went beyond the constitutional competency of Congress. So he is saying, in addition to using my Article II powers, I use Article I powers. That's about as straight and honest and straightforward as you could get as a president. So that's the, that's the greatest crisis we've ever had in our history, and he did not suspend the Constitution. And as far as the Merriman case, it may seem shocking for a Chief Justice to hand down a decision for a president to ignore it, but the fact is that the person who was in a position to help hold the union together was Lincoln. It was not the Chief Justice. And in fact, the Chief Justice, with his Dred Scott decision, had helped bring on the Civil War. So I'm very sympathetic with Lincoln on what he did. And also his Attorney General, uh, Bates, on suspending uh, uh, the right of habeas corpus, did not say that Lincoln could do it. He said that whatever president President Lincoln had was of a temporary nature, of a restricted nature, and the only branch of government that could do it on a permanent basis was Congress. So I think during that time, with all the stress and strain, they took the Constitution seriously. So as you both describe it, Lincoln really is the model of the constitutionalist as president. He doesn't say that he can do whatever he likes. He candidly acknowledges the gaps in his authority. Uh, does what he thinks is necessary, but is careful after the fact to justify his decision as precisely as possible and then to seek congressional authorization. Let us contrast Lincoln's performance with the president who you both said has transformed the nature of executive power, and that is Harry Truman. And tell us, Chris, about Truman's decision to issue an executive order. We know executive orders are not much in the news. Now that President Obama has said he's going to use them more vigorously. Truman issued an executive order to seize the steel mills and keep them open because he thought that national security required it in the face of a threatened steel strike. The Supreme Court repudiated him, and in a famous opinion by Justice Jackson, which you quote, Jackson identified three categories of executive power. So tell us about what those categories are yes. and how they're relevant today. This goes to the point that I think both you and Lou made before about presidential power, about presidents being best served to act with Congress. Justice Jackson makes this point. There's some problems with Justice Jackson's opinion, I think, but that central point, I think, is a good one. And so executive orders, they, they have been in the news recently. I think it's a good opportunity to say a little bit about them, too. An executive order is not magic. It's because a president does something through executive order doesn't automatically make it OK. There has to be some justification. It has to come either from constitutional authority or statutory authority. So um, presidents can't do whatever they want through an executive order. And Truman is a good example. Truman, in 1952, during the Korean War, a war which he began, as Lou Fisher Lou points out, unilaterally on his own, pursuant to UN authorization, which cannot a treaty cannot trump the Constitution. So 
was an illegitimate war, um, Truman saw there was going to be a steel strike and I think it was April of 1952. Um, and Truman said, I can't allow this to happen. It will uh, hinder the war effort. And he issued an executive order authorizing the Secretary of Commerce, a man named Sawyer, to take control of the steel mills to make sure that steel could be produced for the war effort. The owners of the steel factories didn't like this. They went to court and said, the president does not have authority to do this. Congress pretty clearly would, at least, well, at least arguably would, would have the power to take control of private property for a public purpose, as long as the owners were compensated. But the president, they argued, could not. They went to court, and I was just talking to Lou about this on the train up here, actually. Um, the, the Truman administration, the lawyers in the Justice Department, made a remarkable argument to the district court judge, a man named Judge Pine. And what they said was, we believe presidential emergency power means during an emergency, the president can do whatever he wants. He's not constrained by the Constitution. He cannot be constrained by the courts. The only two limits on presidential power that this uh, lawyer from the Justice Department acknowledged are elections and impeachment. The district court judge was taken aback by this, couldn't believe this, and, and uh, rejected that argument. Uh, people, members of the public, sent letters to the president uh, saying, wait, are you saying the courts don't have power to limit the president? Truman ended up having to make a statement about this, backing off a bit from this position. He said, yes, I think the courts can weigh in, but I hope they will accept my position that during an emergency, the president can do what he wants. The Supreme Court did not accept that position, although three justices interestingly did, including the Chief Justice Vincent. In a six to three decision, the court said, no, the president cannot do this. The president is limited by the Constitution. The most important opinion, Jeff says, is the concurring opinion in this case. It's been the most influential one. Justice Jackson, an interesting Supreme Court justice, a little bit understudied. I don't think there's been a biography of him in many decades, but he had an interesting background. He uh, was Roosevelt's attorney general, attorney general in the Roosevelt administration at the beginning of World War II. He took leave from the court to be chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg War Trials. And in this decision in 1952, he said, well, he had been an advisor to the president, to Roosevelt. And he acknowledged, he said, it's hard. Advisors have to figure out what they can do. These raise practical questions. It's not always clear what the Constitution means. The beginning of his opinion, he has this famous line where he says, interpreting the intent of the drafters of the Constitution is like uh, Joseph trying to interpret dreams for the pharaoh through his dream coat. Um, but Jackson didn't actually believe that. Later in his opinion, he says, we do know some of the things that the drafters of the Constitution intended. And one thing they intended is not to create a king. And Jackson said, recent experience also tells us we should be careful of dictators. It, obviously, he was thinking of Nazi Germany. And what he said was, emergency power, once it is uh, accepted can be very dangerous. Hitler had come to power during a state of emergency. He asked the president of uh, the German Republic to uh, grant him emergency power on a temporary basis, and it lasted indefinitely. So uh, Jackson said, let's be very careful about this. When presidents claim emergency power or plenary power, these are very vague terms that place the president above the law, make the president more like a king or a dictator, and there have to be limits on presidential power. And Jackson said, presidents are best served Best, he was, I think he was giving advice to presidential advisors here specifically. When presidents take action, Jackson said, they should seek congressional approval whenever, whenever possible. That doesn't necessarily mean it will always be okay, of course. Jackson had dissented in the Korematsu case a few years earlier where Congress had approved a presidential executive order that led to the internment of Japanese Americans. But Jackson said, in order to keep government under the law and make sure the president is not above the law, the president should seek congressional approval um, in most cases, and that will put the president on the strongest footing. When the president acts against Congress, that's when the president is at the weakest ebb of power. That was beautifully said. I think uh, it's worth quoting from Justice uh, Jackson's language. He was the most beautiful writer on the Supreme Court in the 20th century. He was a very good writer. It's constitutional poetry, and he has these three categories, and we should all know them because they're very relevant to the current debates. So here are Jackson's three categories of executive power. He says, first, when the president acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress, his authority is at its maximum. That's when the courts have to defer. Second, when the president acts in absence of either a congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely upon his independent powers, but there is a zone of twilight in which he and the Congress may have concurrent authority. And that zone of twilight category, Congress hasn't spoken, so the courts aren't quite sure whether or not the president can act. And the third category, when the president takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb. So when he's doing something that Congress said not to do, courts are not going to defer at all. And those three categories define our current debates. Lou, take us up to the 
Bush administration. Uh, Chris tells the history about the fact that after the Iran-Contra affair, uh, a congressional minority, including con Congressman Dick Cheney, issued a report repudiating Jackson's theory and resurrecting the Truman position that the court had rejected in Youngstown, and basically defending the unitary executive and saying the president isn't bound by Congress or the courts in exercising executive power. He can do what he likes, even if Congress has said not to do that. And President Bush and his lawyers resurrected that unitary executive theory in defending the right to try suspected terrorists without congressional authorization to engage in wiretapping and so forth, characterized, you know, as, as neutrally and in a scholarly way as possible, what the unitary executive theory was during the Bush administration and what the reception was to those claims in the courts. Okay, first of all, um, I was on the Rand Contra Committee on the House side for seven months. I was the um, chief researchers and, and wrote a lot of the report. And we heard during that time in testimony in Iran-Contra, people testify that the president has plenary, independent power in foreign affairs. Um, I just want to say something very briefly about the steel seizure case where that theory was floated and shot down. And it was shot down in the following fashion, that when it was in district court, the attorney for the Justice Department said that the courts may not check presidential actions and um, said that the president has inherent authority, inherent, and he said inherent 20 times during his testimony. And after, after a couple times of that, the uh, district judge asked this attorney, if tomorrow President Truman ordered you arrested and executed, would you have any access to the courts? <laughs> And that's not the question this guy anticipated. So he said, uh, there might be some statutory remedies. And the judge said, can you think of anything? Not now, and so forth. And he said, the Fifth Amendment. You can't take life, <laughs> liberty, and property without due process of law. So by the time they got to the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General argued before the Supreme Court. He did not use that word inherent one time. And I think it's very important here in Philadelphia to understand there's a clashing difference between implied powers all three branches have implied powers. They're not uh, restricted to everything enumerated, even though the Supreme Court will say that. I hate to say that the Supreme Court is wrong, but it's wrong on that one and many things. Uh, so you have implied powers. You have to look at express power and draw from it an implied power, and all three have it. Inherent is something free-floating. It's not tethered by the Constitution or any check and balance system. And there's still attorneys today who, in law reviews, will use implied and inherent as interchangeable. They're radically different. Implied, totally consistent with the Constitution. Inherent power is totally antagonistic to the Constitution. Uh, bring you up to the, the Bush years, the unitary executive. We have never had a unitary executive at any time, never. Uh, the, the notion that the unitary executive really says that the president is in charge of everybody within the executive branch, everybody subordinate to the president. We have never had that model. And namely, uh, Attorney General starting in 1823 said that if Congress assigns a duty to an individual in the executive branch, that's not a political duty, that's a legal duty, and the president cannot control it. And presidents would ask attorneys general, can I go in and tell that subordinate what to do? And the attorneys general say, you may not. It's been given to that person by Congress, and so long as that person is carrying out, you may not interfere. So the notion, even John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison made that same distinction between political duties and duties assigned by Congress that are legal duties. So we have never had such a system in the Constitution, and it's totally fabricated. And it's, to it's also totally impractical. The notion that a president can go into an agency that's doing some adjudicatory work and say, I don't like how you did the Social Security benefit or the veterans benefits, I'm going to change it. No, that's out. So nevertheless, once the concept gets out, the unitary executive has a life of its own. And it's, it's like, to me, it's like Dracula. You think you always got it, and yet it flies away again. <laughs> no, it's a preposterous notion. It's totally uh, been from, well, Marbury versus Madison, 1803 on, we've shown that the president is not in control of everybody inside the executive branch. Chris, um, is it fair to say that uh, regardless of what you think of it as a substantive matter, 
the unitary executive theory did not do very well in the courts during the Bush year. The, the Supreme Court rejected the administration's claim that it could detain an American citizen at Guantanamo without access to lawyers, that it could try him in a commission created without congressional approval. Uh, and the administration's own lawyers questioned the idea that uh, people could be wiretapped uh, without uh, an appropriate warrant. Uh, on the other hand, every time President Bush went to Congress after the court slapped him back down, Congress basically gave him everything he wanted. So as a matter of prudence, wouldn't it have been more pragmatic just to ask for congressional approval to begin with? It would be if you believe congressional approval is necessary. There's this interesting, John Yu was a lawyer in the Office, Office of Legal Counsel, Department of Justice, 2001, 2003. And his view was basically congressional approval is welcome but not necessary. He wrote this really striking memo just two weeks after the September 11th attacks um, where he said, when it comes to using military force, these decisions are for the president alone to make. The logic of the unitary executive theory, which Lou was talking about, describing quite well, is that the Congress and the courts cannot restrain the executive. If Congress passes a law that intrudes on what the president defines as executive power, the president can set it aside. So I think the logic of the unitary executive theory is don't defer, if you have to. So it's really contrary to the Young Sun Sheet case you were talking about. If you have to, maybe you will. Maybe you'll see congressional approval if you have to, if the court, uh, if the court issues a contrary decision. But the lot, and whenever possible, the uh, lawyers in the Bush administration uh, would try to argue that they preserve this power. For instance, after Jeff mentioned several cases, uh, the Supreme Court rejected the idea that the president has absolute power, plenary power, inherent power. As Lou mentions, the idea that inherent power to, to simply set aside laws and not be constrained by the Constitution. When the Supreme Court did this in one case, the Hamdi case in 2004, the Bush administration's response was, we're glad, they, they basically, they, they kind of misread the opinion or, or changed it willfully and said, we're glad that the court has recognized the president's power in this area. The court had not done so. Justice O'Connor, in her plurality opinion, said very clearly, a state of war is not a blank check for the president. Checks and powers apply. Uh, checks, and, uh, checks and balances apply. Um, but the Bush administration, because this unitary executive theory was driving them, whenever possible, would, would simply do what they wanted. And although there is an argument to be made, there were some limits placed by the court, or even, as Jeff says, by lawyers within the Bush administration. Some, a man named Jack Goldsmith, who was head of the Office of Legal Counsel um, after John Yoo left, when he found out about the warrant and surveillance program, which was just flatly in violation of criminal law of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, he and several other people, James Comey, who's now head of the FBI, um, said this cannot go on. We can't authorize this. It's illegal. And they were able to get the administration to make some changes. After the, literally going to Attorney General Ashcroft's hospital uh, bed and urging him not to tell the story. There's an incredible scene, which is like something out of the movie The Godfather, where there's a scene in The Godfather where um, Marlon Brando, the Don, has been wounded. He's laying in the hospital, and his son, Al Pacino, gets there to try to make sure he's okay. Al Pacino gets there and realizes there's nobody to protect his father. He grabs another guy and tries to you know, make sure they can scare off the opposing mobsters who are killing, trying to, coming to kill his father. And Pacino gets there first and is able to succeed. Uh, fortunately, there was no killing going on, but this, there's a similar scene where John Ashcroft was very sick with pancreatitis. He's at George Washington Hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Bush administration had been thwarted by Jack Goldsmith and Jim Comey, the acting attorney general, with, with Ashcroft hospitalized. Comey was acting in his place. Comey had said, you cannot continue this program. The Bush administration decided, uh, White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez and the chief of staff Andrew Card went to Ashcroft's hospital bed. They called first. His wife said, Ashcroft cannot see people. He was in very bad shape. They went anyways. They went with papers. They wanted Ashcroft to sign, or perhaps they were going to you know, maybe hold his hand and sign it. I mean, they, as far as they understood, he was incapacitated. Um, Comey and Goldsmith found out about this. They raced over there. They got there first, just like Al Pacino did in The Godfather. And they spoke to Ashcroft, and they told him what was coming. And Goldsmith describes this moment where Ashcroft had been, he thought, really in bad shape. And, and Ashcroft pulls himself up in the hospital bed and says to Gonzalez and Card, this, it's, you know, some of this is still classified, so Goldsmith can't say the details. But Ashcroft says, this program cannot be reauthorized. And in any event, I'm not the attorney general. This man is. He points to Jim Comey falls back in his bed, Goldsmith thinks he's going to die. So it's an incredible standoff, and it shows within the, and this was all, no one knew about this at the time, this outside the administration, and there was this incredible tension within the administration. So yes, there are important moments like that, but one concern I have overall is, was it really effective? Ultimately, even after this whole standoff, 
The administration did go ahead with this program. It continued in roughly the same form for the next uh, year and a half until it was made publicly, uh, people knew about it publicly, reporting in the New York Times. So in these Supreme Court decisions, s several decisions that said there were limits on what the president can do with regard to prisoners, with regard to trials, military trials, none of it shut down these things. So Guantanamo is still open, military trials did go on and are going on. So. Um, in some ways, there's reason to, for hope in terms of limits on power, but in other ways, I'm concerned. Well, that brings us to the Obama administration, and I want to ask Lou about its vision of executive power. I should say some of you are filling out the uh, question cards, and those of you who haven't, Robin will still collect a few and we'll uh, ask your questions in just a moment. Lou, uh, President Obama, former constitutional law professor, comes into office denouncing the excesses of the Bush administration, promising to close Guantanamo, but as Chris describes in his book, not only, not only is Guantanamo not closed, but the president takes uh, an almost more aggressive position on the question of state secrets and the inability of courts to review who is on the list of targeted assassinations because of this state secret doctrine than even President Bush had. I want you to characterize President Obama's vision of executive power. Is If he's not a unitary executive guy, what is he? And in particular, I'm just curious, what was your reaction to his pledge to use executive orders more in the State of the Union? And is that President Truman redux, or is it not a big deal to say he's going to raise the federal minimum wage by executive order? Well, it's, it, it's interesting. When, when Obama ran for the presidency, he made it very clear that he was rejecting the constitutional theory of the George W. Bush administration, particularly on inherent powers. And it, I think it is true that probably Obama has never used the word inherent, but when you listen to him, he's talking the same thing. Now, uh, just to say quickly what George W. Bush did, after 9-11, he signed a military order creating military commissions, saying he had inherent power to do that. And I filed uh, three amicus briefs against the position of the Justice Department, because the Justice Department said, of course the president has that, and it goes back to 1780. How's your sense of history? Are you going to get presidential power out of 1780? There's a John Andre trial, a British spy, and he was brought before a military tribunal and executed. 1780, there's only one branch of government. It's the Continental Congress. There's no president. There's no separate executive branch. Totally crazy argument coming out of the Justice Department. And the Supreme Court held in Hamdan, you have no inherent power. You have to go to Congress for that. So now we have uh, Obama coming in, supposedly teaching constitutional law, and one of his second, the second day in office, he signs an executive order to close Guantanamo. And there should have been some adults in the room to say, don't do that. Check with members of Congress, not just Republicans, for Democrats, because once he did that, a great majority of Democrats and Republicans passed legislation to stop him. So you, have to, you can't get out there on a limb and say, I can do this by executive order. Now, the State of the Union message, he makes a claim, if Congress won't act, I will. Very, very bold. And it's very confusing, because one thing he says he's going to do is to tell private contractors to increase the minimum wage. And you really wonder, well, if that's going to increase spending, isn't that a prerogative of the purse for Congress? And I think the record probably is that he is not acting on any inherent presidential power. There is a statute passed in 1949 giving a president authority. But he knows in his State of the Union address, if he wants to say, if Congress won't act, I will, he can hardly say, I'm going to use statutory authority given to me by Congress. So I think, I don't care who the president is, I think they're on stronger ground when they talk straight. I think you build up public trust, congressional trust, and, and confidence. And it's not just Obama. The, the notion that you can be rhetorical and run around the block with different kind of cl claims, and then you will look for evidence, and it's not there. And I'll, you can be re uh, go for rhetoric and get through primaries and a general election, but when you get in the Oval Office, you have to have some judgments about how your power can be uh, backed and supported, working with Congress, including the other party. There are Republicans he can work with. And, and you don't get into this uh, claim, I can act unilaterally with, with plenary power and nobody can stop me. I can act on my own. That's going to backfire. It backfired on Truman. It backfired on many people, George W. Bush.
and it's backfiring now. So uh, not enough adults in the administration to know, okay, we're in power now, how can we best use it? Chris, you obviously don't talk about the State of the Union in the book, and it's right. more of a domestic claim, but it seems to support your thesis that when the president acts in the face of congressional opposition, he's at his lowest ebb. Yeah. Are there historic examples from the Bush administration or Obama administration or earlier of the president using executive authority to try to achieve things domestically in the face of congressional opposition? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yes. Executive orders go all the way back to Washington. Presidents do this all the time. Often it's non-controversial, but the key is, again, as Lou's mentioning as well, it has to be rooted in some either constitutional or statutory authority. An example, uh, the same statute that Lou mentions from 1949 that gives the president some power, though it's not very well defined, uh, to uh, over federal contractors. I think the authority, I think says he has the authority to increase the efficiency um, of federal contracting, uh, efficiency and economy. President Johnson and President Kennedy as well used that as the basis. President Johnson, I think it was Executive Order 11246 that, uh, set, that established affirmative action in, in federal contracting. So it's something that has been done. But the important point, as Lou suggests, is uh, when a president does this, it's not the last word. If Congress didn't agree with that, with Johnson's uh, decision to uh, require affirmative action for federal contractors, they could take action. Affirm this court has also weighed in on affirmative action as well, obviously. If Congress doesn't like what President Obama is suggesting with regard to uh, raising the minimum wage for federal contractors, they can take action there too. So executive orders have this sound, you know, it sounds like something that's final, and unilateral, and unreviewable. That's not correct. And unless you believe in this unitary executive theory, the president can do what the president wants. But if you believe the president operates within a constitutional system, the president has to identify authority for actions. And the president, as Lou Redley points out, has to take into account what is Congress going to do. If the president issues an executive order that Congress doesn't agree with, Congress can stop it. The Guantanamo order, President Obama said Guantanamo will close within one year. It didn't happen. He didn't get support from Congress. And Congress said, we are not going to authorize funds to uh, transfer prisoners to the United States for any purpose. And it's important to note, too, Obama's plan to close Guantanamo may be not quite what it sounds like. He really was more a plan to move Guantanamo to the United States. But in any event, um, if a president wants to take action, it's important to keep in mind, what will Congress do in response? How can I justify this? One problem Lou and I were talking about before is it's important for presidents to be clear about this. President Obama, in his State of the Union address, as Lou says, he was trying to send a message. You know, I'm going to do certain things. I'll go it alone, work around Congress. He did not make clear how he justifies this authority to take, to take action with regard to raising the minimum wage. And I think it's important to do that. In some other areas, the Obama administration has not been as clear as it should be. For instance, the, the targeted killing uh, list that I think you mentioned before. Yeah, that you're, there's going to be a debate about soon here. Um, it would be very useful for presidents, for President Obama to say, here is why I think this is justified. And when he's not clear, that creates problems. I want to talk about targeted killing in oh, a yeah. second, but Lou, if you were advising President Obama about the dangers of using executive orders to override the express will of Congress, what would the best historical example be? of presidents who've gotten into trouble by saying they can do stuff in the face of congressional opposition. Well, the one you mentioned earlier, go back to George Washington, he issues a neutrality proclamation, not only issues it, telling everyone uh, there's a war between France and England, don't take sides, of course, they're gonna take sides, that's what Americans do. But then they decided they'll prosecute people who violated the proclamation. And one of the great things happened, we always say, well, constitutional issues go to the Supreme Court and so forth. This one went to jurors, because you would have to go in uh, prosecuting someone to have jurors uh, willing to go along. And jurors says, no, you are not a king, Mr. President. You are not a king. Maybe the king could do a proclamation and nail it on trees, and that's the law, but not here. If you want to have a proclamation policy with criminal offenses, you need a statute. You need to go to Congress. And Washington got the message and says, you're correct. And he went and a year later uh, told Congress, I've done something here. Maybe you can do a lot better. And that became the Neutrality Act. So that's a great example of a president thinking he could act unilaterally to make criminal law. No, you cannot. And the ordinary jurists <laughs> told him, instructed him on what the Constitution means here in the United States. Great. I'm glad I asked. That's a great example. <laughs> we have a lot of great questions, but we do need to talk about 
uh, President Obama's rather robust, as you describe it, Chris, assertion of the state secrets doctrine. Oh, yeah. There are two relevant cases, and essentially, as you put it, administration lawyers have extended the relevant precedents to say that uh, Alan Lockley and his father yes. can't even challenge whether or not he's on the list of people targeted to be killed because to reveal whether or not he's on the list would be a state secret, essentially completely immunizing this secret process from any kind of judicial review. In what way was this an expansion from previous case law? Well, Lou has written extensively about this, as with many things. He really is the leader in this field. And uh, the state secrets privilege was uh, created by the Supreme Court in the Reynolds case in 1952, I think. Is that right, Lou? Oh, 53, sorry. And what the court said in that case uh, was created a dangerous precedent. Uh, it said there is a state secrets privilege, and when the executive asserts it, um, when the executive claims during litigation there's classified information, we can't reveal it, it would undermine national security, uh, the court should accept that claim, even without seeing the actual underlying documents. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to dismiss the whole case, but it, doesn't, it should not require the government to turn over those documents. In the Reynolds case itself, the government had made a claim there had been a plane crash and uh, a number of people on the plane had died, including some civilian employees of the military. Their widows filed a lawsuit. I believe it was actually in Pennsylvania. It was, I think it was in Philadelphia, court here. Um, and the widows filed a lawsuit and wanted to find out what had happened. Uh, they wanted to see the accident report and a report from surviving witnesses. The government said, national security information, we can't turn it over. They didn't actually initially make that argument, but the court kind of created it for them, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and the United States Supreme Court said state secrets privilege applies. The government doesn't have to provide that information. Uh, the case went ahead, and it did settle, but for less money than the widows would have otherwise gotten. Decades later, it turned out the information at issue was not state secrets. It, was, it simply showed that the government had been negligent. They, they knew there were problems with the plane. They allowed it to fly anyways. So the danger of the state secrets privilege is that it's sort of like Truman's position endorsed by the court, that the court does not have the power to oversee the president. Um, it's, it's, it's over... It's kind of an overly deferential position by the courts. When, when the executive makes a claim of state secrets, that the court should defer to it without actually reviewing the documents in camera, which they could do. That happens in court proceedings. Um, it's not an, uh, not an extraordinary thing to look at documents without making them publicly available. And the idea is the court could then see, oh, is this really sensitive information or not? The Obama administration, and the Bush administration did as well, but I think Obama has even perhaps made it stronger, has used this doctrine to essentially close out cases. When some, like Anwar al-Awlaki, who was not a sympathetic figure, he was a US citizen, born in 1971 in the United States, um, became associated with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula as kind of a propagandist. He, because he spoke English, it was very valuable to al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and the United States government said, we think he's more than just a propagandist. We think he's involved in planning operations against the United States. They didn't prove that, though. Instead, what they said is, we're, we've made this determination within the, uh, judicial, within the executive branch. We're going to order his killing. He was killed in a drone strike in Yemen. His 16-year-old son was killed a couple of weeks later. Still not completely clear why or how that happened. Um, al uh relatives have brought a lawsuit um, claiming this was uh, unconstitutional, that violates the Fifth Amendment to kill a citizen without due process. And the executive branch's response, first of all, is um, they've suggested this in, in documents uh, that have been released, uh, that, they, that the executive branch believes it has the power to do this on its own without a hearing or trial, order the killing of someone who's suspected of being a terrorist leader planning attacks against the United States. But the more, more direct, sort of more immediate concern, as Jeff mentions, is they've also argued that um, cases like this simply can't go ahead because allowing the case to be litigated would reveal state secrets. If that position wins, it would mean that the case isn't even decided on the merits. And they've used that defense successfully in a case, the Jefferson case, which involved extraordinary rendition, this practice of taking people who are suspected of being terrorists, sending them to other countries where they are tortured. And there were some really extraordinary claims of really graphic torture brought in this case. Um, the Jefferson case was dismissed by the Ninth Circuit based on this state secrets argument. So yes, that's, that's sort of the Obama administration's approach. Okay, uh, lots of great uh, questions. Uh, Lou, uh, Chris writes about this uh, in the book, but uh, give us the answer. Uh, the question is Syria. What does Obama's actions or leadership uh, decisions say about his view of executive power? Will it have an impact on future foreign policy and war 
decision. I think, I think the, what happened in Syria last year is fascinating to me because two years before, or three years before in, in Libya, uh, President Obama, just like Truman, goes to the Security Council and gets a, a resolution and claims that's sufficient authority. Um, and uh, very interesting what happened because Obama in 2011 said uh, uh, this will be a matter of days, not weeks, in Libya. It turned out to be seven months. Uh, Obama said uh, we're there to protect civilians. Uh, then mission creep came along. Suddenly we're there to uh, side with the, with the militias. And we're there to do regime change, get rid of Gaddafi. And you have a broken uh, Libya today as a result. So I think the inability of presidents, not just Obama, but anyone, to say, oh, it'll be this. And it turns out uh, wars have a momentum of their own. And Obama was uh, sadly inaccurate on what happened in Libya. So I think when he then threatened to use military force in Syria, send cruise missiles into Damascus. I've been to Damascus. I mean, that's uh, Secretary of State John Kerry said sending cruise missiles into Damascus will be uh, unbelievably small. I think if any cruise missiles came into Philadelphia or New York City or DC, we would not say they're unbelievably small. We would say an act of war. Uh, Syria had not threatened us. There's nothing to do with defensive war. So I think what was extraordinary about the House members were at home, and they're hearing from constituents. And it's, we've all been saddened after Vietnam. I think constituents are not as active as they used to be on military activities, maybe because of the volunteer army. But it was amazing. 90, 95% of constituents were telling their members, do not support military action in Syria. And uh, Obama, who claimed I have constitutional authority to do this, uh, very interestingly said, well, let's go to Congress for authority. He might have, might have gotten very close vote in the Senate. I don't think there's a chance of him getting any support in the House. So that was quite a, a remarkable public debate over the scope of presidential power. And then, as you know, uh, he found a way out to work with Russia and, and get chemical weapons away from Syria. But that was a very close call, and Obama has never backed away from his uh, claim that he can use military force against other countries under some sort of Article II commander-in-chief power. I think it's completely imaginary on his part, Truman's part, and, and George W. Bush part. I, I will say George W. Bush did come to Congress to get statutory authority for Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so. Uh, I think Syria was a terrific national debate, which is very nice. The Constitution doesn't belong just to the three branches. It belongs, this is the self-government. This is the popular government. And there was this really strong words from the American public, don't do this. And in practice, maybe that vindicates Chris's thesis that regardless of what the president said, in the end, he did bow to this public opposition and refused to assert the authority, even though he thought he had it. Uh, this is from Trish on Facebook. The National Constitution Center is fully up to the moment technologically, and the question is, how can we clarify when it is a time of war versus a time of peace? So that's an excellent question. Um, it's, it's difficult, especially because in the context of this, this war on terror, that's the subtitle of the book, I say, you know, there's this war on terror that's going on. What does that mean? Is there any endpoint? How could that possibly, I mean, terror is really a tactic. It's not a specific enemy. And I think what's problematic and dangerous about that is there's, there is an argument to be made for presidents having more power during emergency, during crisis, um, when there's a real emergency and there's not an opportunity to get approval from Congress in advance, like with Lincoln during the Civil War. If you have an ongoing emergency and the argument is, well, the president needs enhanced power throughout this ongoing emergency, well, it's not an emergency anymore. That's just the normal state of, of affairs. And I think. Uh, that's dangerous for the constitutional system. I also think it's dangerous for the nation just as a whole. Um, we, we are in this, this constant state of war, um, but it's a, it's a sort of strange state of war. It's a state of war that affects some people much more than others. For people in the military or their families, it's a really direct and immediate and ongoing thing. For the rest of us, it's something we kind of know about and hear about it, but it doesn't directly, directly impact us, and I think that's a problem for the country because um, the idea, when the Articles of Confederation failed, it failed because there wasn't a real country, there wasn't a strong enough country, the Constitution created a nation, 
And I think it's difficult to have a nation if you have only a small part of the country fighting a war, a war that doesn't seem to have a clear endpoint. So in terms of clarifying this, I think, as Lou mentioned, there can be debates about this. There should be. Um, people need to, to raise these issues if they care about them. Um, and there should be real questions asked about what does it mean to be at war? The, the authorization for the use of military force, which does, there is, Congress did pass uh, an authorization after September 11th authorizing the president to use military force against Al Qaeda or people harboring them. Um, when the war in Afghanistan ends, as it's expected to end this year, the president will not have congressional authorization left to act. So what will happen at that point? And I think there should be debate about this. What does it mean? Does it mean that there will be operations going on? I think the president thinks so. Um, but Congress should, should ask these questions and consider how it wants to uh, set the terms of uh, presidential power. Can the president just continue to, to act, or will there be limits on it? Does it make sense for the nation to be uh, continuing military efforts indefinitely? A short follow-up, Lou, and then short the final question. Yeah. These words, war and peace, it's really very fascinating in American way they speak about these things. Presidents always seem to say, stay away from the word that I have a right to go to war. They don't say that. So when Truman went to, quote, war in North Korea, he was asked, uh, would you say you went to, is, is this war? And he says, no, uh, it's not war. And the, the reporter said, is it a UN a police action? Yes, it's a UN police action. And then the Clinton years, when he was bombing Iraq repeatedly uh, at some University, some student asked Secretary of State uh, Albright, Madeleine Albright, uh, how can President Clinton go to war without congressional support? She says, you have to be very careful with your words. What we are doing in Iraq is not war. It's military operations. Okay. So this dance around words is very interesting. They, they seem to know that war is for Congress. And we'll call it anything we want to to make sure the president can, can we know it's war. It was war. Eventually, uh, the Truman administration, Dean Acheson, says it's war. I mean, we know it's war. Depends what the meaning of war is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, here's a great last question, which really sums up the theme of this fascinating discussion. And the question is, can a president break out of the unilateralist tradition set by previous presidents? Chris, you'd think any president who read your great book would think, boy, it's not a great idea to make these unilateral assertions because I'm going to get beaten back by Congress and the courts. And yet, as you've described it, presidents from Washington to Obama keep asserting their power to act in the face of congressional and judicial approval. Why? And can you imagine a future president learning the lessons that you so wisely counsel? Well, I kind of need to say, I think this is something the framers really got right. Madison writes in the Federalist Papers, um, if, if men were angels today, we'd say if people were angels, you wouldn't need government. You wouldn't need to make sure government was limited in its power. But of course, people are not. Presidents certainly are not. Presidents tend to want to seek as much power as they can get, and I think I, one would expect that. Um, I, sometimes, I, this isn't a perfect analogy, but sometimes I describe presidents as being like a great white shark. If you put a seal in the water with a great white shark, the shark will attack it. If you go in the water with a wetsuit on and a surfboard, the shark might think you're a seal and attack you. You, you have to expect that. Now, of course, the difference is a person who's president can you know, think about things and make decisions, but what I mean by that is I think the point of having checks and balances and setting limits on power is the other branches and the American people um, have to make sure that presidents are limited by the Constitution. I would not expect presidents to do that by themselves, um, so I don't necessarily, necessarily rely on that. But I think what they do, as Lou mentioned, they recognize when there are constraints on their power. If, for instance, Congress, when Obama is thinking about going to war in Syria, um, says, wait a second, you can't do that, that will change what presidents do. So I think the real hope is what Congress does, what the American people do, what the press does to set limits on presidential power. And if presidents say, see that there's a downside, that there's a risk, or that there will be negative consequences for them if they go too far, they expand their power too far, then they will change how they act. And that Syria was a hopeful sign for that, I think. Great. On that optimistic note, please <laughs> join me in thanking Lou Fisher and Chris Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> <coughs> Jeff, Jeff.